Hi, I'm Nick Angler, and you're probably here because you watched a time-lapse video and where I show you at lightning speed how to make these cutting boards. Well, <clears throat> that gives you a pretty good overview of the process, and I do suggest uh, that if you haven't watched it, uh, go back and see it. It's a lot of fun. And then come back here, and I will explain to you in detail just how to do it. The technique that I'm about to show you for making these herringbone cutting boards is extremely versatile. You can make hundreds, but thousands of different patterns uh, just doing what I'm about to show you how to do. Now, I want you to know before we get started that all this information, including plans for the jigs and the fixtures that I'm about to show you, I've put into a PDF project plan that is available at the Workshop Companion General Store. Uh, just take the address and the uh, URL, cut and paste it into your browser uh, address bar, and it'll take you right to the plan. Okay? Let's get going. But the thing that you have to remember about all of these, no matter what design you decide to make, is that there are two glue-ups. I've made this little plywood representation just to show you what happens here. First of all, you glue up strips of contrasting wood to make a long skinny board. And then you take that same board and you cut it apart at an angle to make more strips. And then you take those strips and you glue those back together and that, after you cut off the little sawtooth at the top and the bottom, will become your cutting board. But, how do you know how long and how wide to make your first strip board in order to get the cutting board of the size that you need? Well, there's a little math involved and I'll walk you through it right now. Okay guys, fair warning. I'm about to show you some uh, mathematical formulas, but before all the mathophobes among you go running off into the night, uh, I want to tell you that I too slept through my high school geometry class. But all this is is just an application of the standard Pythagorean theorem. Uh, and if you have a cell phone with a scientific calculator app, you're good to go. Before we get into these formulas, uh, there's some numbers that we need to plug into the formulas. So specifically, we need to know the width and the length of the cutting board that you're about to make. Now, the length is going to be determined by the pattern you want to make, specifically by the number of strips and the thickness of those strips that you're going to be gluing together. For the formula, we need to know the width of the thickest strip. Take a look at this drawing here for a minute. Uh, this is the glue-up board that we're about to uh, make. These are the strips that we're going to be cutting out at an angle from that glue-up board. Now notice that at the beginning of this board, there's a triangular piece. This is some waste uh, that we're going to generate, and there will be another triangle at the end of the board just like it. Now I'm calling it waste, but keep them, uh, keep them handy because there's some things we can do with these boards that I'll show you in a little bit. But let's get back to... Uh, to this. These strips that you're cutting out at an angle will have to be turned and then glued edge to edge. When you do so, notice that there's some more waste at the bottom and the top of each strip. These form little saw teeth that you have to cut off in order to make this rectangular cutting board. The, uh, the length in between these two triangles at the top and the bottom of each strip is what I'm calling the usable length. All right, here's the first set of formulas. Now, before I get started, I want to explain to you that everything I'm about to say is also in the PDF project plan that I uh, mentioned at the beginning of this video. Uh, if this stuff goes right past you, uh, don't worry about that. You can do one of two things. Either take a screen grab of this 
and uh, look at it later and try to figure out what I'm talking about or get the PDF. Now, these formulas that I'm about to go through are only for that, uh, those times when you're cutting the strips from the glue up board at 45 degrees. 45 degrees is a special angle for reasons that only people who understand trigonometry uh, can explain to you, but it makes the math a lot simpler. Uh, let's start with the width of the cutting board, which is uh, equal to the usable length of the strength of the st strips that you want to cut. Take that usable length, add it to the width of the thickest strip, and multiply that number times itself to get it square. Divide the square by 2, take the square root, and that is the width of the glue-up board that you want to make. The width of that glue-up board is also equal to the length of the waist. Let's go back to this drawing for a minute. Okay, here's the width of the, uh, the uh, glue-up board, and you'll notice that the waist is the, same, uh, is the same number. This is an isosceles triangles where both the sides are equal to one another. Uh, that's one of the special things about that 45 degree angle I mentioned. Next, let's go to your strips. Now, each time you cut a strip, okay, you're actually removing more wood than you might think. Uh, look at this. This is the hypotenuse of that triangle of waste that I talked about. Uh, the hypotenuse is actually 1.414 times the, the width of the strip. So if you're making a one inch uh, strip, you're actually removing 1.414 inches from the uh, length of the glue up board. So you've got to take uh, the sum of all your strips, multiply it by 1.414, and uh, uh, that gets you how much wood that you, that you need. Well, almost, because you also need to take into account the curves. And the curves also have to be, <clears throat> be uh, uh, multiplied by 1.414. Uh, if there's going to be 15 curves to cut these strips, uh, and they're all 1 8 inch, uh, inch curves, multiply 15 times 1 8 inch times 1.414, and that's how much wood you need for the curves. Take the sum of the waste at the front of the board, the sum of the strips times 1.414, times the sum of the curves times 1.414, and that gets you the length of your glue-up board, which I'm calling B right here. Next set of formulas. <laughs> now don't panic. These have stuff in them like sines and cosines and tangents. And I'm not going to explain it because it's actually the same formula. It's just for, this is the, uh, uh, is for every angle other than 45 degrees. And uh, you'll work it in exactly the same way, but remember that you, uh, every time you come to the angle that you're using, you'll need to look up its sine or its cosine or, or uh, its tangent. Uh, this little, uh, uh, symbol right here. looks like a zero with a uh, bar through the middle. That's called theta, Greek letter theta, and that's used in mathematical formulas to indicate the angle. So if the angle is 30 degrees, okay, every time you see the symbol for cosine or tangent or sine, uh, you plug in uh, 30 into your scientific calculator. Uh, use the scientific calculator on your smartphone, okay, uh, plug in 30 and hit sign, and that will need, give you the number you need for these formulas. Once again, do a screen grab or go to the uh, project plan that we have on our store. All right, let's look at some of the patterns that you can make. Each of the patterns that I'm about to show you can be made from just five widths of strips. Um, the... Uh, thickest strip is, uh, or the widest strip rather, is one and a half inches. The thinnest strip is a half inch, and then I've got one and a quarter, one inch, and three quarter inches uh, in between. Now, in the patterns that I'm going to show you, uh, I have coded these five, four, three, two, and one uh, in descending order from thickest to thinnest. Uh, and 
those five strips actually get us 10 elements in the design because each strip, depending on how you flip it, can have the grain sloping down or the grain sloping up. So when you uh, see five, that indicates that the strip is one and a half inches uh, thick. And when you see D, that means that the grain is sloping down. 4D, one and a quarter inches, grain sloping down. 1U, half inch, grain sloping up. So let's go for the first for the first pattern. Now this is the simplest of all herringbone patterns. Okay, you have just one uh, thickness of a strip and they're just flipped. Uh, one up, one down, one up, one down, one up, one down. Uh, and it makes a, uh, a nice pleasant pattern to look at. Uh, by the way, by the way, um, if any of you are wondering how well these cutting boards hold up, okay, this one is about two years old, but this one, this is a herringbone also, I made 25 years ago. And you can see it's, uh, it's a little darker, but otherwise it's in, it's in great shape. Uh, even though you have the grain directions of all these uh, woods going every which way, uh, each piece is short enough that it doesn't put too much stress on the glue joints in between them. Okay, let's go on to something that's a little bit more imaginative. I call this M's and W's, okay? And this is what you get. If you look at it this way, you got W's, you flip it over, and you got M's. And it's made from two different sizes of strips. You've got half inch strips uh, and then one inch strips. And there you have one inch, one inch, half inch, half inch, one inch, one inch, half inch, half inch, repeating over and over again through the length of the board. Pretty neat. This is my favorite. It's called Heartbeats. And <laughs> gotta look through all the boards to find them. Here it is. Okay. You have you start out with half inch strips and you continue that uh, <laughs> up and down, up and down several times. And then all of a sudden you have a medium sized strip, a really wide strip, another medium sized strip, and then you go back to the narrow strips again. Okay. Uh, and you repeat that pattern over and over again several times. Each, uh, each jump from medium to, to uh, a wide to medium makes it uh, look like a heartbeat in an EKG. Next, let's look at expanding and contracting. Okay, This uses all five of your... Um, uh, whoop, wrong one. Here it is. This uses all five of your sizes of strips. You start out with uh, number five or one and a half inches. You go down to one and a quarter, one, three quarters, half, and then you go back up. Half, three quarters, one, so on. And you repeat that over twice to, uh, to uh, form your pattern. And last, here we go. This is something I call serendipity. It's not really a pattern as much as it is uh, just sort of uh, uh, grabbing a, uh, a, a particular size and uh, uh, and then uh, choosing at random another size and choosing at random again. And uh, 
you put that together, and because as you can see, it makes something uh, it makes something pretty visually interesting. But one thing you have to remember as you're doing this is you don't want to, as you're making your zigs and your zags here, you want don't want to go too far downhill or too far uphill. Uh, you want to keep this relatively. Uh, these these points in a relatively straight line so that when you cut them off you can make a nice square cutting board like you see here okay that's it that's just five out of thousands of possibilities so with that let's start gluing some strips together and act actually making some of these I've cut a lot of strips here, enough to make up the width that I need from the uh, scraps that I had in my scrap pile. There's a lot of different wood species here too. Uh, walnut, maple, cherry, sassafras, uh, even some purple heart. All different colors and I'm arranging them right now so that I've got contrasting colors of strips next to one another, uh, trying to make it so that I don't have two mediums or two darks or two lights uh, next, to other, next to one another because they'll just blend in. Uh, after all, this is a herringbone cutting board, and you want all the bones to stand out. When you get these arranged the way you want to have them. Take a straight edge and draw a diagonal line across them. That way if for some reason you have to uh, pick them up off your workbench and carry them across the shop uh, and you happen to drop them you can still get them back together exactly the way you wanted them. Uh, I have done that dropping before and believe me it's uh, this is a time saver. We're going to do this glue up on a special jig that Travis and I have made for those occasions when we want an assembly to be perfectly flat, true, and or square. As you can see it's nothing more than a torsion box with some slots cut in the top and holes cut around the sides and the ends so that I can get a clamp everywhere I need one. Now we've waxed the top of this torsion box so that the glue won't stick to it and I've also waxed the uh, coals and the pressure strips I'm using so the glue won't stick to those either and then uh, just as an added precaution I put some wax paper between the pressure strips and the strips that I'm going to glue up. Now this is a dry run. We, uh, there's no glue in here yet. I'm doing this so as to set the clamps exactly the way I want them. Now what I plan to do is put these strips in and I will draw them together with the bar clamps, the long ones, okay, but only lightly. I'll leave them, them actually pretty loose and then I'll put in the shorter bar clamps and these uh, deep throat C clamps to press the strips down flat against the torsion box and then I'll go back and I'll tighten up the bar clamp and make sure that I get some glue squeezing out everywhere. Uh, by the way, uh, if you would like the plans for this uh, uh, gluing jig, this, to this torsion box, we include them with the project plans that I mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, these are available from uh, Workshop Companion General Store. When you apply the glue, you want to work pretty quickly. With this aliphatic resin glue, you really only have 20 to 30 minutes of working time. So you've got to get all these boards together before that time expires. You'll notice that I'm using a carriage bolt on all thread to spread out the glue. As you can see the threads do a remarkable job of spreading the glue quickly and evenly. 
so that there's an even amount of glue over the entire surface when, I'm, when I actually press them together. You also want to make sure as you go, you're lining the boards up with this diagonal line that you just drew so that you know all the boards are in the right order and facing the right way. As soon as you get to the point in your glue up where you're where you're doing the final tightening on the on the long bar clamps, pay extra attention to whether or not you've got glue squeeze out everywhere between the boards. You want really want these joints to be as tight as possible. You probably want to leave the C-clamps and the short bar clamps a little loose for this operation. Uh, you know, just, just tight enough to hold the boards flat. But not so tight that they interfere with drawing the, the uh, wood together. Then you can go back later on, like I'm doing now, and tighten up the short bar clamps and the deep throated seat it deep throated C clamps. There. I've got a lot of glue squeeze out and it looks like a pretty flat assembly. So I'm happy. When you get done gluing up your uh, your strips, you'll find that the workpiece may be stuck to your uh, glue up jig, <clears throat> even though you waxed it, no problem. Just take a bar clamp, put it under there, and pry up, and it'll break the glue. All right, we now have two boards uh, that we've glued up. Um, this this board, the shorter one, is enough for a single cutting board. And this one, the longer one, will make us two. Um, now, before we can throw these through the planer to even up the, uh, the wood strips, we have to remove the glue beads. And the glue beads will just gunk up the blades in, in the planer. So I'm going to work mostly with uh, an old paint scraper that I've uh, sharpened up to knock off these glue beads. But there are so many of them, I'll probably have to use a chisel and uh, a chisel plane uh, to get all of them off. Let's see. All right, all the boards are planed, and I've jointed one edge, and I'm get getting ready to cut the strips from the board. As you can see my setup here, I'm using a sled uh, to make the cuts. The sled has an adjustable fence on it, and I've adjusted that at exactly 45 degrees from the, uh, the path of the cut. Uh, the, I'm going to use this fence right here to space or register the boards as I cut them, get the, uh, get the width of the, of the strips, but I don't want those strips to be pinched in between the blade and the fence. At that point, the blade might uh, uh, take a hold of a strip and throw it at me. So, to prevent me from having to dodge those bullets, I've added a spacer right here. When the, the cut gets past that spacer and the, the uh, strip drops off and it's free, there will be plenty of distance between the blade and the fence and it won't be pinched. The spacer is exactly one inch wide, which means I can still use the rule over here in order to set the position of the fence. All I have to do is subtract one inch from whatever it's reading on the rule. So, let's make some sawdust.
Okay, you notice that I'm cutting each of these strips in turn, setting and resetting the fence as I go, rather than cutting all of one width and all of the next width and, that's, and, and so on. The reason I'm doing that is I want the grain in this to look as, conti as uh, continuous as possible. When you get done cutting the strips that you need, uh, you'll have two triangles of wood left over. Uh, keep these. Uh, there's something you can make out of these and I'll show you at the end of this video. All right, well, here we are back at the uh, glue up jig. I'm carefully arranging all the pieces and parts here before uh, before we start applying bar clamps, making sure everything fits properly. Uh, and you'll notice that every now and then, uh, there's a little protrusion or nub on one of these pieces. This happens especially on the narrower pieces. Uh, when you finish the cut, the piece falls off before the blade has a chance to cut that one last little bit. Uh, unfortunately, that one last little bit will interfere with the fit, so you've got to take that off. So I've got a piece of 100 grit sandpaper right here. I'm just going to rub that on that. just takes a few seconds, and now it fits just fine. And I'll go look for the next one. And there it is. All right, we finished the uh, dry clamping here. I'm getting ready for actually doing the wet clamping. As you can see, I've used a good proportion of all the clamps in my shop. Now I've got the bar clamps, which will squeeze the strips together, and then the, uh, the hand clamps and these bars help keep the, uh, the wood flat on the, on the jig. The jig is all waxed, the bars are all waxed, and we're ready to go here. All right, we've glued up all the strips that we've cut, uh, made the three big cutting boards, and you remember those little triangles that were left uh, at the end of each board? Uh, well, we took those and we cut those into strips too, and I made a couple of uh, smaller cutting boards. Uh, this is just a standard chevron. Uh, but here I took the strips and I staggered them uh, so as to make kind of a sawtooth pattern. So we're going to get five cutting boards, three big, two small out of this. But first, we now have to remove all those glue beads that I didn't wash off. And to do that, I've laid out the tools that I'm going to use here. I'm going to start with an ordinary paint scraper. But I've taken this paint scraper and I've put a really sharp edge uh, right there with a mill file. Same way you would sharpen a scraper. And I'm going to knock off all the biggest glue beads. There we go. Now, for those stubborn glue beads, you can also use a chisel like this and go in and pare those away very carefully. Okay. Or, if you happen to have a chisel plane, uh, you can set that so that it'll cut the beads but not the wood. There we go. Now, I'm going to take a cabinet scraper. At this 
point, I'm removing both wood and uh, a little more glue. Now, in the uh, time-lapse video that uh, most of you watched, uh, I used a belt sander and uh, followed up by a random orbit sander. And you can do that. That's, uh, that's fine, but I thought it might be uh, nice to show you a different approach. Using just hand tools. Okay. That surface is actually beginning to get smooth. Now, we'll come back to the scrapers, but I'm going to switch to a smoothing plane. This is a number, number three uh, smoothing plane, but I've tuned it so that it takes a really, really shallow cut. And I'm just going to kind of scrub this board and uh, get all of the strips so that they're at the same height. next step is to trim these uh, glued up strips uh, to make the actual cutting boards and that means getting uh, rid of the pointy parts on either side. Now in order to do that we're going to uh, cut them on the table saw with the aid of this horizontal fence. Uh, this is uh, a guide attached to uh, a jig that is actually attached to the uh, to the real fence and you'll notice I've set the edge of this guide the horizontal part so that it's absolutely flush with the left side of the saw blade by attaching a straight edge to the uh, this uh, cutting board blank here we'll be able to guide that along the uh, horizontal fence and make a perfectly straight cut. First of all, though, we have to figure out where we want to make this cut. I'm going to take this straight edge and position it so that it's at the lowest valley. The valleys are caused by the zigzags here. and I'm going to mark that line and that's where we want to cut that. I'll attach the straight edge with carpet tape, double-sided tape. Three small pieces should do, should do us here. Now, the carpet tape is covered with a pressure sensitive adhesive, also called sometimes a pressure activated adhesive. And I'm taking the dull side of my knife and pressing down hard on this tape to activate that adhesive and make the tape stick to the wood. Now, let's put this guide on roughly even with that line I drew. Great. Now I'm going to take a dead blow mallet I'm going to give it a few nice whacks. <clears throat> Remember what I said about pressure activated adhesive? Well, the momentary pressure of the mallet blow uh, activates the adhesive, makes the straight edge stick to the uh, glue up I'm about to cut. All right, 
and let's cut it. go perfectly straight cut I'm going to chamfer the edges of these cutting boards now that I've got them cut to size uh, the uh, chamfered edges will make them more pleasant to handle of course but it'll also keep the corners from uh, from chipping I'm using a router mounted in a router table and a chamfering bed to do this however you could also use a low angle block plane and a little bit of handwork if you wanted The last step before we can finish sand these cutting boards is to fill all the um, uh, knots, uh, chips, gouges, uh, and uh, since we've got a lot of walnut in here, some of the pith uh, that, uh, that presents open spaces where water or food could collect, uh, we have to make this surface perfectly smooth. Now you could use the old trick where you mix sawdust with glue and put the glue and squeegee it into the uh, depression you're trying to fill and let it dry. However, there are a lot of different types of woods here and that's a lot of different types of sawdust to, to uh, try to gather up. So instead, I'm going to use stick shellac. Now stick shellac is a type of plastic that comes in these little bars and you melt the plastic, drop the uh, or mush the uh, melted plastic into the depression that you're trying to fill and then you smooth it over with a hot knife. It uh, cools almost instantly and it's ready to sand right then and there. The trick is to get the color of plastic that you need. They come in assortments like this and so what you need to do is you need to have the color that this wood is going to be when it's finished. So I'm going to take some of this uh, naphtha here with this paper towel and rub it on the area right around this walnut pith that I need to fill. And see that? The naphtha turns the wood the same color it's going to be when it's finished, but the naphtha also evaporates very quickly so it won't interfere with the finish. You can see it's already starting to evaporate there around the edges. Now, I'm going to pick a color. This looks like it will probably match that walnut pretty well and uh, get it hot with the plastic. Now it will catch fire, that's all right, um, as long as it doesn't, doesn't burn to the point where it actually gets charcoal. Now this is going to take quite a few mushes to fill that pith. One more. There we go. Now we get the knife hot. I'm using an alcohol lamp here because, uh, quite frankly, a propane torch is just a little bit too much, too aggressive for this. It'll get the knife red hot and it'll burn up the uh, the stick shellac. But the uh, the alcohol lamp takes a little bit longer, but you get a better result. There we go. Actually, I got that a little too hot. That shouldn't have smoked like that, but it'll, it'll work. There we go. Pith filled. And <clears throat> by the time I finish this sentence, it'll be ready to sand. On to the next little bit of pith, which is right over here. I'm going to start sanding these things now. Um, I'm going to keep the stick shellac handy because there's always a knot or a crack that you missed on the first go around. And how you can fill it on the fly because uh, this stuff cools so quickly and is ready to sand almost immediately. I'm going to start with 100 grit and I'll work my way up to 180. After all, these, uh, these things are going to be used with kitchen knives later on, so there's no sense in going any finer than that. Um, that is, 
if they get used at all, you're going to find that uh, a lot of people that you give these to or sell these to uh, will just use them in their kitchen as decoration. They're so beautiful. So, let's get going here. I'm finishing these cutting boards with tongue oil. The traditional choice would be walnut oil or mineral oil. Uh, however, I like tongue oil. Walnut oil and mineral oil are uh, low in toxicity, which is why they're often used for wooden kitchen utensils. Uh, however, tongue oil is also low in toxicity. It, uh, of course, it isn't any good for you while it's still in liquid form, but once it dries, it forms a locked matrix that you cannot digest. So if any little bits of tongue oil happen to make it from your cutting board to your food, they won't adversely affect you. So in in that sense, tongue oil is also non-toxic. Now you'll notice that I am sanding in the tongue oil. Uh, not only does this force the tongue oil deeper down into the uh, wood where it will uh, help bring out the depth of the color that we're looking at. It's also forming a paste. The uh, sawdust and the tongue oil mix to form a slurry. And as I'm sanding it, I'm forcing those into the pores in the wood. Now I've used quite a bit of open grain wood for this. The walnut, the oak, the sassafras, the purple heart. And I don't want any little bits of food getting down into those pores and sticking permanently to the cutting board. So this paste will dry in the pores and help seal the food off from doing that. Now you probably are going to have to reapply the tongue oil from time to time. You'd have to do that uh, with any oil, mineral oil, walnut oil. Uh, as you wipe these cutting boards down from time to time, like you have to, it just lifts out more and more of the finish. And uh, pretty soon it takes on a dull look. Of course, that is presuming that these things are going to be used. As I said before, a lot of people just buy these to look at them. Okay. Once you've got it all sanded in, wipe it down, get the excess off of there. That uh, slurry will make a real, once it dries, will make a something hard and unsightly that's difficult to sand off. There we go. Now, a little finishing tip here. I've got a bunch of pizza tables, okay? These are the, uh, the things that you get when you order a pizza for delivery. They keep from the box from smooshing your pizza. They make wonderful little finishing tools to help hold the uh, whatever you finished up off your workbench. Oh, there we go. All we have to do is let it dry now and then we'll rub it out. You can apply as many coats of finish as you'd like. I am uh, stopping at two. If you go on to up to four coats of tongue oil, it gives a nice uh, deep shine to the finish. It all depends on whether you're making a cutting board or a, uh, uh, a work of art. Uh, I rubbed it out with uh, this light gray scotch Bright. Uh, it's about 600 grit, and I'm going to apply a coat of paste wax with what used to be white Scotch-Brite. It's hardly white now. 
that's about a thousand grit. Each one of those helps polish the finish a little bit more. And the wax adds a little more depth. The wax, by the way, also helps seal the wood against moisture. In fact, if you keep these cutting boards waxed, you'll probably never have to refresh the oil. All right. Once you get the wax on, let it dry a little bit till it goes dull, and then rub it out with a soft cloth or some paper towels. Buff it. All right. And that's all there is to it. Here are all the cutting boards that we made, finished and waxed. These are the three large cutting boards and the two smaller cutting boards. Now, uh, if these were scrap wood projects for you, these would be scrap wood, scrap wood projects. And a couple years ago, we made a bunch of these cutting boards for, um, for Christmas presents. And I took the scraps from these cutting boards and made Christmas ornaments. And those, of course, would be scrap wood, scrap wood, scrap wood projects. Okay, <laughs> I'll show myself out. Thanks for watching.